Hello, everyone. Oh, good God. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, so I'm sure they hear me online now. Hi, I'm Kim Lewis. I'm the school social worker here at the high school and actually throughout the district. Um, I want to welcome everybody tonight, those online, people here. Um, a pupil service department here at East Troy Community School District has put on this presentation. Um, so I'd like to just to highlight a couple people that are here. We have Aaron Judd, our Dean of Students. Uh, Dominique Boston, the counselor at the high school, Corey Pekonen, school psych, Ben Hurdle, counselor here at the high school, and Jean Freud, uh, counselor at the middle school, and Stacy Keene, our principal here at the high school. And Amy Fospadchek is our director of curriculum, is also here. Um, so thank you everybody for coming. Wanted to um, I'll let them introduce themselves, but thank the panel of experts that we have, like as a parent and as an employee of the district, I'm super excited to be partnering with the community to provide what we need for our students um, as society and everything's changing, that partnership and cohesiveness is more important than ever. So thank you all for coming and we'll start in respect of everybody's time. Thank you. All right, uh, thanks for having us. We really appreciate it. Um, my name is Aaron Winden. I'm a public health specialist at Walworth County Division of Public Health. Um, we are located in the Health and Human Services building in Elkhorn. Um, and my primary role is uh, strategy and planning, so working a lot with community organizing, um, as well as I have a background in social work, so um, working uh, just with different populations um, in the prevention aspect is what I'm doing now. My name is Patty Strateski. I'm also a public health specialist um, in Walworth County. Um, my role mainly focuses around family health, so looking at a lot of those um, different areas of where we can support families um, and also work alongside Erin with our community health improvement plan. My name is Chris Kordick and I'm a family medicine physician in McGuanago with Pro Healthcare. Um, I am a new attending and I did residency up in Waukesha, um, so familiar with the area and kind of the needs of Southeast Wisconsin. Hi, I'm Michael Cotter. I am Thomas Cotter's father, who Thomas is 10 and he's in fifth grade. <laughs> so um, that's the most important part of me, I think. So, but I'm also a 1989 graduate of East Troy High School, which I think is important. You can do the math, I'm 51, so I'll save you the math. Um, but yeah, 1989, I graduated from here, I think. And I'm, I'm proud of that, I think that's important. Um, from my background, and I also serve as the municipal judge in the village of East Troy, and I am the corporation counsel for Walworth County. So we do all the non-criminal legal work for the county, including all the um, uh, child abuse, neglect, and prevention, all the mental health uh, guardianships, whole bunch of stuff we do through the corporation counsel's office. So I kind of have a unique dual role. Um, I also am missing basketball tonight, so that's important. Um, Thomas is in there because he had a uh, dental work, so we're, we're off tonight, so I can chat with you for all a little while longer. But um, I, I'm passionate about my, the work we do in, in the juvenile side of municipal court, and I have some uh, background that I can give, and I just came from court, so I have all sorts of brand new stories we can share later. Not really talking about anybody, but we'll, <laughs> just, the, just the background of what, what we do there is important. So that's me. Okay, so um, we're just going to start. So we're here today um, just to really kind of give you an overview of what, um, you know, vaping looks like right now for our youth. So we know no one's going to be surprised to hear that we have a lot of adolescents and youth that are vaping right now. Um, we're here to really talk about some of the health impacts. Um, there's negative health impacts, not only physically, but also mentally. And also keep in mind, this is what we know right now. We do not have that long-term data that we have with, um, that we know with cigarette smoke, right? Traditional cigarettes. It was a long time for research. Um, right now, what we know is short-term. So there's more to come. It's not gonna be promising. Um, but this is just some information you could then share with your teens um, or even younger, and we'll talk about how to have those conversations a little bit um, as we move on. So this is some, I won't get too deep into data, but the YRBS is Youth Risk Behavior Surveillance Survey, and that comes out every two years. Most recently, um, it was collected in 2021. So this is telling us about 
kids in the different age groups, um, you can see in the grades above that have used, keep in mind this is among the students that have participated in this survey and among the schools that have participated in this survey. And we can also kind of assume a little bit it's slightly underreported, um, but this certainly shows us a trend um, and we're seeing that increase, right, as they get um, older in their grades. And then when this next one is a little bit of a breakdown that tells us also from that survey the amount of kids that have actually tried within the last 12 months ever using a vape product and they also have tried to quit vaping. 52%. So we know if you if you ever tried to quit smoking or anything like that, that's hard, right? It's 52% of, of kids have tried to quit and not to be pessimistic, but they were probably unsuccessful, um, especially because likely if they're vaping, they're not sharing that with a trusted adult, um, so they don't really have that support that they need. So we want to uh, approach this with a way to help support those kids to be successful in quit quitting and also in kind of celebrating their successes as they move along. Kids are trying things younger and younger. Um, so most kids are saying that at the age of 13, by the age of 13, they have tried their uh, vape product. So that's what, eighth grade? Um, so we know that kids that are trying vape products at younger ages are increased likelihood that they're going to become people who smoke later on in life. Um, whether their stance on that is that they want to be a smoker or not, um, it really increases their chances, and especially starting at such a young age. We've been here before with cigarettes. Um, we, you know, cigarettes started right with that advertising. Um, it started out as something medicinal. Then it was something that even your doctors uh, endorsed. I don't think that you're doing that now, right? <laughs> okay. Uh, so we've come a long way. We're seeing some of those policy systems and environment changes now with cigarettes, um, and it's totally different now. We are not there with smoking. So almost every uh, tobacco company, big tobacco company owns at least one vape company. So that means they're trying to recoup some of that lost revenue from um, the lack of cigarette sales. And they're using the same tactics with their cigarette advertising that, um, that they, they're using the same tactics with vaping advertising that they did previously with cigarette advertising. And they're really targeting kids with that. Um, you might not be seeing it because Kids aren't watching TV. They're on YouTube. Um, they are, um, I just want, I don't want to sound old, but um, they're like in their in-app platforms um, on advertising like that. That's where they're seeing that those ads and they're specifically targeted at youth and we don't have the constraints that we had with cigarette, um, with the cigarette ads. So it's important to know that they're really it's, it's unfair, really, that they're targeting that youth in that way. Um, so it's important to really kind of build up our youth with the more information that they have so they can make those responsible decisions. Patty, but it's kind of worse, isn't it? Because they're making it seem like it's a better alternative Absolutely. to smoking. So I hear that in court all the time. Like, well, at least they're not smoking. They're, you know, they're vaping, so that's better. But that's, that's the biggest thing. And plus then all the, all the cute little names like, you know, fruit juice and yep. raspberry Absolutely. surprise or whatever. They the know exactly what they're doing. <laughs> you All got right. it. So just so we're on the same page, um, we were kind of talking about this earlier. Um, vape products, they look different. They look fun, right? We are just talking. That's pretty appealing. Um, and But what it is, so you're heating up a liquid. The liquid is turning into an aerosol. That aerosol is getting inhaled into the lungs and then exhaled. It's not harmless water vapor. We say vape, which can make us think. I, I have a 23-year-old son, and I remember having this conversation. Mom, it's just juice vapor, um, and having to have that discussion about what it actually is. So we know that vapes contain nicotine, ultra-fine particles that can really damage the lungs. Um, they can contain um, compounds that you normally find in things like pesticides, varnishes, and paints, and then the flavorings aren't innocent either. Some of those oils, if they get into your lungs, can be really dangerous. And then as well as we've all heard probably most like the heavy metals, 
tin, nickel, and lead, and things like that. And all of those can cause damage, and none of them are really safe, especially for youth. Okay, nicotine, very addictive. So nicotine, same drug that we're seeing in um, cigarette and other tobacco products, incredibly addictive. Um, this is especially harmful on a developing brain. Their brains don't really reach full development to about 25 years old, and then some of you might even want to question that. However, um, this has especially impacts on learning, on moods, on um, their brain development um, as a whole. So it's why we really want to protect them. Um, you know, in this crucial time of their brain development. So it's not only those physical effects, but it's also those things that affect their emotional well-being as well. It's a myth that vape products are actually um, a way to reduce stress, but, but it helps me because I'm, I, you know, it calms me down, but they're not even realizing that the vape itself is that thing that's actually making them anxious because they're trying to that gap between using your device and needing to use it again gets closer and closer and closer, and that your mood in between isn't usually great. Okay, overall, we see lots of harmful effects on the body, anywhere from brain development, um, your lungs, ear, nose, throat, your heart. Um, again, I wanna keep in mind, this is what we know right now. There are you know, long-term effects and research that we just don't know yet. And flavoring, um, cotton candy sounds nice. Um, however, um, we know like a lot of that is made from um, oils that aren't meant to be digested. And again, when those droplets get in the lungs, it can be very dangerous. Um, but by no mistake did they add flavoring to the product. It appeals to kids. It makes it seem like when something is mango, well, mango's good for me, um, that it's fun. And most kids would not even have tried it if it didn't have a flavoring in it. So, because you don't want to have the vape that tastes like tobacco or tastes like nicotine. So I'll just let this one sit for a while and you guys can take a look at it. I'm sure if we talk to kids who are currently vaping, they would probably tell us, because we've done a really good job talking about the dangers of cigarettes, that I would never touch it. Um, they probably think they're a little gross. But what they don't realize that the amount of nicotine that's actually in um, vape products is very concerning. Um, a pack of cigarettes is 20 milligrams of nicotine. They can get up to four times plus that, depending on the device. When they add in large amounts of nicotine, the nicotine, that means they can be a faster addiction, that means they're buying more of the product. So it's, it's really concerning. Um, nicotine addi addiction, even at a young age, can lead to more addictions later on in life um, for more harmful drugs because we're opening up those pathways. The way we talk about it with our kids, though, and, and how we talk about it, though, is, is really important. Yeah, so moving on now from the things that we know are harmful are harmful, but how do we start to have that conversation with our kids and the youth? Um, and eight may seem a little shocking, um, and that may seem young to start having really in-depth conversations with kids about vaping or any other risky behavior. Um, but it might, it doesn't have to be really strong, in-depth conversations. Um, it can be small, casual conversations just as to um, what a risky behavior is, why it's important to know and out of a situation. So if you're with your friends and you're offered something, what's something that you could do? What's a phone number you could call? Um, so we know that starting around age eight is when kids start to form their own opinions about things, um, less and less about what uh, their parents or caregivers uh, are, are thinking or their opinions on them and really start to form their own opinions. So it's really starting to have those small, casual conversations. Um, we know is actually pretty helpful, helpful because as Patty said, uh, that a, a large percentage of the individuals who, at least with just vaping, have tried vaping was before age 13. Um, so if we can give them that five years 
of tools in their tool chest to um, really kind of build up some of their self-esteem and their confidence in order to say no to a friend or say no to uh, a get together where they're at where other kids might be doing it or trying it. Um, that's just five years of time that we can hopefully buy to make someone a little bit more confident and make our kids a little bit more confident. Um, so really taking and just having those small conversations. And as you leave today, or maybe you grab them when you walked in, we do have some tips in the back table about how to start those small conversations. Um, so again, it's not really sitting them down and having you know big in-depth conversations about it, but really just those casual ones um, that might be able to grab their attention. Oh, it's up there. Thank you. <laughs> and then after this, so after we're done tonight with the Q&A, uh, we do have across the room and, and down just a little bit of ways out to the right, a uh, hidden in plain sight room. And what that is, it's uh, a mock bedroom of a teenager that just has uh, anywhere from 25 to 30 signs of potential risky behaviors and things that um, someone could have in their bedroom. And then Patty and I will walk you through if you would like and kind of show you what some of those items could be. Very innocuous things that you might find in someone's room that you might not think might be of a risky behavior, but something that you can look out for. Um, and again, it's not to you know go home and start digging through your, your kid's room. It's really how do you start to have those conversations or when you start to see some maybe symptoms or signs of risky behaviors, how to have those conversations with, with your kids or teenagers, whatever, it, whoever, whomever it might be. Yeah. And so Ed, I'm going to comment a little bit about a few different things. So when I see patients in my office, I might see somebody between you know middle school and high school, maybe once per year, maybe once every two years, depending on how healthy they are. And so that's roughly one touch point per year, where as a doctor, I get the ability to go in and, and educate these young minds about what exactly is happening. I get to go in, I get to screen, I get to ask all these questions, but I don't know if you remember when you were young and at the doctor, it's not exactly the most comfortable place to have a conversation, right? You might be in a gown, I got my stethoscope on, I got my scrubs on, you don't know me from Adam, and now I'm trying to build this relationship, so if I don't see you yearly, I don't get that trust. And until I get that trust is when I can educate and I can teach and I can inform. And so it really falls back on the parents and the people in the child's life. And I oftentimes try to tell my parents in the office, you know, this is not what you grew up with. This is not your marijuana. This is not your cigarette. This is not your, your vape if, you know, they're young enough to know what that is. And so what we're dealing with now is we're dealing with drugs that are laced with bad compounds like fentanyl. We're dealing with you know, cigarettes that are much higher in terms of their pollutants. We're dealing with vapes that it's not just the jewel pod that you buy from the gas station, it's the dab that they got from somebody off the black market that might have THC or other components in it. And I had the ability to treat quite a few patients with popcorn lung, and I don't know if you guys have heard that. It's a, it's a buzzword, well, pre-COVID buzzword, for a sensitivity pneumonitis that comes from superheating these compounds. And we still don't know the long-term effects that it has on, on these lungs. You know, kids are resilient. They heal very quickly. They bounce back. But we don't know the long-term effects of what this scarring is going to do. We don't know if they're going to get COPD, which is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, similar to cigarette smokers. We don't know what age they're going to have. We don't know if they're going to be left with oxygen deficits, what medications they're going to need in their 40s, 50s, and 60s to be able to breathe. And so there's a little bit of fear that comes along with this, but the fear comes from the uncertainty. And so as you go through the display that they've set up, look for things that are educational points. Try to familiarize yourself with, okay, what behaviors are my child demonstrating? What, what conversations have I had? What conversations have I not had? And it all starts with education. And so if you think about it, if you can educate somebody and you can allow them to make their own informed decision, they're more likely to have a behavior. So all things addictive come from a point of education. You want to make sure that you stop them from making the decision before they have it. Because once they go down and they, they have this addictive substance in them, it's going to be much harder to get abstinence from that. It's going to be much harder to get sober if it's an addictive substance. The other thing that I will say is, you know, we talked about the 20 milligrams of nicotine per cigarette. Um, when I worked in the hospital, I would prescribe patches for my chronic smokers anywhere from 14 to 21 milligrams, and that's over 24 hours. So these kids are getting way more than what they would get if I wrote a cessation plan. And we have medications that can help with smoking cessation. I'm sure you've seen Chantix, the commercial with the turkey in the cigarettes. I don't know if you guys have seen the, the quick cold turkey commercial. 
But we have medications like Chantix, we have nicotine patches, we have lozenges, we have you know, therapy, people have tried hypnosis and acupuncture. None of them are foolproof. And I will tell you that every patient who I've talked to who has smoked in their lives, not one of them has said, man, this was a great decision. Not one. And so that's an educational point for your child to say, it's not a good decision to start. Let's focus on why you don't want to do that. And so I'll open it up. If you guys have questions for me, we can, we can move on and we can do something after. But if you guys have questions, I'm, I'm happy to take those at, at any point. Yeah, well, I guess I'll keep going. I, I just want to reiterate that, like, if you have questions, like, I want it to be as interactive as, as possible. But first of all, I wanted to thank everybody for coming tonight, first of all. It's, it sounds a little patronizing, but it's it's really important. And and thank the panel and, and the school staff that's here as well, and, and most importantly, the, the parents that took the time. And just to kind of give a little bit of overview, I've been I've been working with the school for a number of years, and... This is probably the second time we've done something like this, and I think the plan for this year was to try to try this time and maybe do it again in the spring, um, something similar, you know, just to keep these discussions open and um, kind of bridge the the um, some gaps that we've had in the past. So again, I'm the I'm the municipal judge in the village, and I so I see all the uh, juvenile tickets that come through mostly from the schools, right? So I have, I have all the schools are in the village of East Troy, so I get to see all those. One thing that I wanted to say at the outset is my biggest mission of anything I do in municipal court, my goal every year is to impact one kid a year. That's my, that is my entire goal. And what I mean by that is just nudging a, one of the kids I see in court uh, hopefully incentivize them to, to A, not be back in court, but just change their path a little bit. Because the kids I'm seeing are all good kids. They just made, like, a bad decision, right? Like, they, they did something that got them to court. I don't see bad stuff. I'm, municipal court is, like, entry-level court system stuff. But my goal is that they don't graduate up the system. And, and I have a whole war story about why I feel that way and, and kids that matriculated up the system that really bummed me out and I wanted to quit like 10 years ago. Um, but with efforts with the school to try to make an impact, I've, I've hung around and I think we're getting, some, getting somewhere now. But so that's what, I, that's what my goal is. One thing I want to try to normalize and make, make it seem like it's not a big deal because it's really not a big deal is the the youth that I'm seeing in municipal court that are seeking therapy um, of some type, either through the school, through Health and Human Services, through Pro Health, and I'll just give you, we put these numbers on the panel, but I think it's, it's or in the pamphlet that you might have seen, but since COVID, I don't remember them off the top of my head, but I'm somewhere close. In since we reopened in COVID, and Kim's gonna, is gonna check my work, I think, she's gonna look. <laughs> That's okay. We'll see how see you can give me an A or an F because I think I've, it's either going to be all or nothing on this <laughs> one. So it, since we opened up in COVID, we were closed court, you know, because COVID, that was a big stressor for everybody, right? But especially the kids in school. And I'm still seeing it. I saw it tonight, you know, the, the anxiety and the stress that these kids are coping with is real. And I just want to talk about it like it's, it's okay to say that your child is getting counseling because since we opened back up in court in July of 2020 I think the number was 68 percent from um, of the kids that I've seen since July of 2020 till to tonight has been 68 percent and it's more than that because I batted a hundred percent tonight in court so the kids that I had before me are all seeking are either seeking therapy are in it or are trying another form so 68% since in the calendar year uh, of this calendar year, prior to tonight, the number was 75% of the kids that I was seeing, three and four. So the reason I bring, and tonight was 100%, so that number bounced up, whatever the math is. I, I failed calculus, so I went to law school. So uh, that's true, that's actually true. I failed math at Wisconsin. So that's, that's uh, 
and I retook it and got a C. So that's 10 credits of D work. I'm oversharing a little bit, but <laughs> that's, it, that's all. I lie a lot, but that's true. Um, <laughs> but, you know, that, I think it, it's just so important to talk about, and, and it's especially important for the, for the youth to, to know that it's okay to talk to somebody, because sometimes that's all they need, and they don't need to talk to mom or dad or me or, or whatever, but if they talk to somebody, and the, the, the most, the coolest part that I have going on right now in municipal court is I have two social, I'm gonna just take a little time because no one has questions yet. This will force you to think of a question. <laughs> but I have health and human services with me at all my municipal court hearings. So every, every uh, juvenile that comes before me and their parents automatically have health and human services sitting right there and handing out information. That's a huge deal because it's, it's a, it's a long drive to Elkhorn when you're a single mom or single dad and you have a four-year-old and a seventh grader and you can't get away. The last thing you're going to do is drive to Elkhorn to seek help. And it's a lot easier when they can reach across the table and take a card and then make that connection. And that has been huge for the community. It's really a big deal. And we've upped it this year where now every... Um, we have another social worker, because I complain a lot too, so I, they, Health and Human Services is tired of dealing with me, so they finally gave me another social worker that does um, alcohol and drug screening at every, every court night for these juveniles. That's a big deal, and it's, it's, a, um, it's great. It doesn't matter if they're a sixth grader or they're a senior, they're all getting that screening, um, and they're all really good about it. And that I learn a ton from the ju from the juveniles I have in court, and they're very open, and they're willing to talk about it. But it, um, I'm just, if you take one thing away from me, it's that it's okay to, that they're not alone in this, the, all the anxiety and the stress that they're dealing with. Um, so, because, and it's awesome that we have it in our community. So, I don't want to see you in court for the parents, but if we do, we have that it's nice that, to know that we have. But, it, but along those lines, as I joke around with stuff, I will, will, I'll make those connections otherwise. You can call me and say, hey, my kid doesn't have a ticket, but can, we, can you help us out with this therapy thing? Absolutely, and I'll, I'll bridge that, I'll make that happen. You, know, you don't have to wait until you get the ticket. Um, we can do that, we can skip the ticket part and just set you up with that. Um, so I think just that normalization of, of therapy is really important. And, the, and it's really, it is very tough to be a student today. I think we would all agree to that, right? I, I use this in, somebody's got to get a question if I keep, or I'll just keep going. But yeah, go ahead. So the, <laughs> so the school district partners with an agency in the community that provides counseling in our school. So they come in, they see your student here at school, it's less school time missing, parents aren't having to worry about traveling, they work with your insurance, um, it's offered district wide, maybe kindergarten, I don't know, but first for sure through 12th grade. Hmm? 4K. 4K, okay, so 4K through 12th grade and offer that, like, I mean, it's a wonderful service that um, is available here within our community as well. So, and then I will ask a question yeah. from a parent standpoint. Let's say you do, so the whole drug and alcohol, like licensure, or not licensure, but like age of consent and things like that. So let's say I have a 13 year old that I want to bring in to the doctor that's vaping and they won't share information. Like as a parent, what are our next steps? What do we do? So when you come into my office and, and I have a pediatric patient, um, we do what's called a confidential risk assessment. So depending on the situation, you know, I often ask mom or dad, you know, please step out or guardian, whomever's with them. You know, just going to ask you to step out. We're going to have a conversation. I'll bring you back in when we're all done. And then it gives me a chance to talk to the patient alone. And it might allow for some more comfort. It might allow for some more disclosure. And everything that we talk about is protected health information. And, and the state of Wisconsin has certain laws that allow us to keep things from the general medical record, which if you guys use my chart or any online 
uh, documentation services, it would be a hidden note similar to what you would find with a mental health professional. So you have to break the glass, we call it, to access that. And parents may or may not have access depending on what's going on. So with good certainty, I can assure the patient, you know, this is protected. What we talk about stays between us. It's, it's doctor-patient confidentiality. Um, now, if there becomes a point where they're suicidal or there's more concerns for the patient's life or somebody in their lives, and I have some, some concern without a doubt, then that's a little bit different, and I disclose that to the patient prior to having that conversation. But <clears throat> if the parent knows that the behavior is going on, the best thing you can do is give us as the healthcare provider a heads up before the visit and pull me out of the room or catch me before I come in and say, hey doc, just want to let you know, found a jewel in, in Timmy's room or I noticed that Susie was hanging out and she smelled like mangoes or her car smells funny, right? Like something like that where I can go in with a little bit of information so I can tailor that and I can pinpoint and I can be precise. Um, there's a term called motivational interviewing that we use to try to figure out exactly what's going on with, with our patients and try to figure out their gauge of how willing they are to do something. So if I know going in, I can tailor kind of my attack on that and get more information out. Now, as the parents, I would ask, you know, you may or may not know the outcome of that conversation. And so that's where trust with the healthcare provider comes in play. And that's where, you know, having a frank conversation while we're in the room together and encouraging an honest, open conversation together is beneficial. And I often do, as do, do most of the providers in my clinic, say to the child or the pediatric patient, have you talked to your parents about this? And if not, why? And try to figure out those barriers. Try to figure out what concerns they have. Now, questions for you guys, because... I like this, and it's fun. <laughs> what are some signs of anxiety that you might see in a young adolescent, you know, maybe middle school, maybe high school? As parents, what are you looking for to see hmm, something might be off? Do you guys have any ideas? Anger. Anger. So give me an example. Uh, just maybe a short answer. Just okay. navigating. So irritability. Yeah, irritability. Yeah. Okay. What else? changing sleep patterns, who said that? Okay, so what do you mean by that? And, and what are you looking for that caused the change? Uh, so, you know, are they sleeping less? Mm -hmm. Okay. So sleep patterns, irritability, anything else? Isolation, yeah, withdrawing. What else? Safety as well. Okay. Um, some people might be uh, emotionally mm -hmm. scarred back, and they're not doing work. So these are all these are all great answers, and and unfortunately, we live in a in an age where there's a lot more ways to connect than we used to have. You know, I'll disclose my age. I'm 30 years old, so I'm relatively young. Um, when I was in high school, the text message was the thing. Now I have a computer in my pocket that has internet access, it has video access, it has communication access via voice, text, and video. And oftentimes, you know, people have these devices at their bedside. People have these devices with them 24-7. I'm sure we've all felt that phantom vibrate in our pocket. Did I get that text? Did I not? You know, these devices and how we interact with them change our thought patterns. They change our rewards. Similar to what we were talking about with the nicotine and how you need more of that, it's the same thing with these devices. And so now you're taking somebody who may have had a rough day at school, they're going home, and that rough day can continue on social media. That rough day can continue in text messaging chains, in uh, WhatsApp, in Facebook, in whatever platform they're using that really lowers their defense to be able to make a rational decision when it comes to, is this a good choice to try this vape or is this a bad choice to try this vape? Because they're already so beaten down from the constant communication. They're so beaten down from the fact that their sleep patterns have changed because they can't sleep at night because they're worried about that text message they sent or they're worried about that picture that's on social media. And so in addition to counseling about the substances and the addictive things that, that are out there, such as alcohol, drugs, and the vape, you also have to counsel about the addiction that is technology, to be honest with you. 
Um, how many parents here make their child's device go to sleep at night in a different room? Wow. Can I have you guys as my patients? <laughs> um, that's excellent. And that is something where the sooner you can enact that, the better. Because we found uh, there is sleep hygiene. And so sleep hygiene is essentially utilizing your bed for rest or illness, having a wind down time, 30 minutes to an hour before bed, um, understanding that you should dim the lights or be in a warm light environment versus the blue harsh light that we have here. All of these things help the brain regulate sleep. And we know that sleep is absolutely vital to adolescent growth and development. If you can give them good sleep, if you can give them a good environment to where they can rest and recharge, they are more likely to make better decisions and think rationally in time of need. So plan in peace for time of war. That's essentially what I tell my parents. Establish those good, hab those good habits now. Get them in a good physical fitness regimen. Get them in a good sleep regimen. Allow them every possibility so that physiologically they can make those good decisions. Have you guys had conversations with your teenagers about sleep, about cell phone use, about vaping? And, and if you have, how do you open those conversations? What words do you say? <laughs> the school counselor here, we talk to kids about that all the time. Like every day we have kids sleeping in class. Why are you sleeping in class? I was up all night. Well, why were you up? I mean, no, you weren't studying for your social studies test. Why were you up? Yeah. Oh, my phone. I kept, I literally screamed, like, I'll, I'll throw it out there. Kids will be on those apps or those, like, FaceTime. They'll literally FaceTime and fall asleep talking to their friends. Like, their boyfriends are So 48% of high schoolers and 46% of middle schoolers had some sort of technology at 9 and 5. And I will say, Judge Cotter said it best, there, there is no stigma about counseling. There is no stigma about mental health. And, and, and in the past, I would say five to 10 years, there's really been a good push to normalize mental illness and to normalize the fact that it's okay to not be okay. And the past three years with the pandemic and with everything that's going on, you, you took a normal lifestyle, you shook it up, then you said everybody has to stay at home, can't communicate, can't talk except digitally. You normalized that, and then by the time people were getting used to that, you then said, oh, let's open everything back up again. And so the amount of change that these young developing minds have gone through, minds that need habit, minds that need structure, the amount of change is, is absolutely insane. And, and I will say, you, you need to take Judge Cotter up on his offer for therapy and counseling services, because in the medical field, I will say, I have patients waiting months to get into a pediatric psychiatrist months to get into a, a therapist, a counselor, because of the needs of the community, because of the lack of providers that we have. And so if you have access to this and if you have a concern, 
be proactive, get involved early. It might be one or two visits to establish the tools that you need, but once you have those tools and you know how to utilize them, you're gonna mitigate the problems further on down the road. I was just as a school, we, you know, we have our lessons on this kind of thing. Like that's part of our job. Like that's what we're required to do. Mm -hmm. Offer student lessons on this, parent presentations, that kind of thing. But, um, but like she was saying, like in the community now, now what? Because clearly there's a need. But how do we just say, oh, everyone needs therapy? Yeah, I mean, and that's reactive. Mm -hmm. But what I'm trying to say is that. I think what I what I, I'm not going to say to do this, but I'm going to do it. Like that, I'm getting out of this conversation. And as far as my like digital hygiene, is I want to be that I I don't want to be on my phone as much. I'm just as I can't say to my son. You know, he's ten. We've talked about him already, but I can't say to him, you can't be on your phone when the first thing I do in the morning is grab my phone and check it, right? Or when I'm at dinner and I'm looking at my phone like I've got to be a little self-reflective and not um, and I'm not saying I'm not lecturing for people to do that but I'm taking that's one takeaway I'm gonna walk out of here with is I gotta I gotta monitor that myself because that that is it is it is totally addictive the the whole and I'm just talking for me like I've checked it I've checked my phone once already since I've been here you know and what for what like really but that it's such a, a addictive thing that you, that you want to check, and I guarantee it. If I pulled my phone out, then other people would get anxious, and then they'd be like, "I better check my phone." It's try it once. That totally works. <laughs> You're at some it cocktail party. You don't want to be up. Pull out your phone and watch all the other people that do it. Like, oh my god, I better check. But I, I, that's one. To, it's a good point, and I I think that's to be mindful of what we do. Um, and, and setting the, that good example, that's something I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to work on. I think part, I'll, I just need to jump in there initially, not about that. I think that incident is one of the reasons we're here. I, you know, it's, it's a pile of, you know, a bunch of little sticks that get piled up to something. The school can address it um, more, but the, the, as long as you're talking about that, well, I'll let, I'll let the school go. I won't forget what I was going to say. I don't know if the school wants to weigh in. Stacy left. Um, we, you know, we're trying to be proactive within the schools on a regular basis, providing education, things like that. But ultimately, it's a confidentiality thing. You know, like we're not, you know, I can't address that. It's a confidentiality thing. Like, and like you said, like kids make poor decisions at times like that's a reality of our lives like that's a reality of everybody's lives I can't say I've never made a poor decision in my life like but being proactive and being here and the education that we hope that we're providing at school and building the relationships that we have with these students are what's important and if students have questions about what happens they know that they can come to staff and we will support all the kids but I mean, ultimately, it's confidentiality, and we all make mistakes. 
Yeah, and I think also realizing that when we when we know these things are happening, that was a symptom for some of those students of, of as the panel has been discussing, difficult things going on in their lives. So making sure that for our whole student body, we're providing different tiered levels of supports that we're providing information to every student. And then those that are struggling more, we're giving more strategic and targeted interventions and supports for them. Um, but as we know, like, like the panel's been saying, this is a very tough time to be growing up and, and there's a lot of temptation and, and just they're being bombarded with things just 24 seven. I, I wanted to bring up one, one thing just about vaping. Um, I hope that, did that kind of answer your question a little bit? Yeah, um, but one thing before I forget, are we we're gonna go down the hall pretty soon and look at the that's at seven, right? Whenever. Whenever. Okay. So one thing um, that I've really noticed the shift in in court is with this whole vaping thing. I don't remember the last time I had a pure vaping ticket. The most of the the vaping tickets I'm receiving now are all THC related. So there, it's all marijuana loaded into these um, pods that they, that they heat up. And th that right there is very alarming. And I, a, a quick, you know, I'm not going to screw up any confidentiality, but just to illustrate a point, um, a few years ago, I had a student in the, that was before me that was in the middle school that had absolutely no idea that they were smoking marijuana in the vaping. I, what did you do? I, I was vaping. Did you know it was in it? No. Did you know that it was marijuana? Absolutely not. And, and I believe the person. Like they weren't trying to pull one over on me. They, they had no clue. And the, the amount of vaping tickets that I have, and I, I could pull this, I don't know exactly the amount but I bet it's been probably prior to COVID was the last time I got a, a regular, like a jewel vaping ticket. Since that time, it's all been marijuana that's been involved. And the doctor can correct me, what I, or Health and Human Services, what I've been told is that the, a marijuana cigarette, like a joint, would have like a 7% potency, and then the Cartridges are like 70% to 80%. It, it's different how it gets absorbed because it's a different, it's not the smoke, it's a water vapor. And so depending on how much they load it with, and then depending on is it a dab, is it not, right? So you get higher concentrations with different mediums that are in these things. And it's obviously not regulated. It, it's right. not like you're walking down to your local marijuana shop that is regulated, that has certain things and all these most of these kids are getting it off the street or they're getting it from a friend or so-and-so is bringing it over and saying, okay, give me your five bucks for this, yada, yada. And they don't know. And, and to be honest, they, they truly don't know. They're ignorant to it. And they don't understand that just because they got this and it's compatible with their device, that it's unsafe. They think, oh, it's compatible. It must be safe. The manufacturer must have done it. They don't understand that there are bad people in the world who are trying to do bad things. I think, what's that? Oh yeah, so the, the individual asked, how do you know the difference between a, like a marijuana cartridge and a regular, what might be a nicotine cartridge? And I, I'll be honest, you don't. I, I mean, until it's used, um, you wouldn't really, they're, they're gonna look the same, they're gonna load the same into the product. Um, so knowing the difference would be the person who bought it, if, if they knew that um, if, beforehand getting it, so yeah. I don't know that. A different, uh, the individual asks, is there a difference in smell? Um, I don't know. I don't know either. I will say from the, from the kids who I've talked to who have used this, there has not because these flavorings all have the similar scents. So it's blueberries, it's bubble gum, it's mango, it's, it's never marijuana. <laughs> and so because of that, you know, depending again how they use it, is it the wax, is it the cartridge, is it the prefillable tank? There's, a bunch of different ways to get it in 
you don't know until you either pop on a drug test or you notice signs of marijuana intoxication. That's it. So yeah, that's, a, that's a good question on the back end. Um, are you saying can you test the actual inhalation device or test the cartridge? I mean, theoretically, you could test the cartridge. Yeah. I don't know of any tests that are out there. Like I, I, I don't know of anything. I don't know if you can just walk into a Walgreens or a CVS and grab a test to test that kit. I, I'm not sure about that. Um, yeah, and I don't want. Well, and then typically, like you had mentioned, we don't. You know, if, if THC, THC is being added, it's being manipulated to be added to that device, um, which is dangerous. Um, and then you're getting it from somebody that. You don't, you don't know. You don't know that person. You're just buying it off of somebody who was advertising it on Snapchat, and yeah, I'm gonna get one of those. Um, and you just don't know what's in it. Um, so going as far as testing, like you said, I don't think yeah. there's even anything out there that can do it, that can test it. Those are really good points, and, or good questions, and they illustrate points of like, we just don't know. Yeah. And then, you know, how does, the, the fascinating thing for me is when I have, kids in court, I'll talk to them about this. I learn more from the kids than I read in any book. You know, they, they're, they'll tell me exactly. You know, they'll, they'll describe, they'll give me brand names, where they get it from, how they get it, you know, what, and, the, and then there's the other kids that just don't have no idea. They thought they were vaping a jewel and didn't realize it was THC, but talking to the, I think having that conversation with your, with your kids, if you have kids, that they might not do it, but they'll know. My, again, back to my 10-year-old, he knows exactly who vapes in the middle school. He can give me names of, he isn't, but you know, like he knows. And that's back to your point about an eight-year-old, that's frightening. Some people are like eight years old and you're gonna talk about that. My 10-year-old is telling me stuff and knows about mango juice or all the names because the, the marketing is so good. And there's the other thing that this misconception is, well, it's got to be better than cigarettes. That's a prevalent thing that I hear from parents in court all the time. At least they're not smoking. And that's the, that's something that's very, you know, very frightening. But, you know, again, if you can talk to your kids about it, they'll, they'll tell you stuff. And I think it's health. I think it's healthy to have those conversations. Um, and then you can learn something too along the way. And in regards to the it's better than cigarettes argument, when vaping first came out, there was a thought that it could actually be used to encourage tobacco cessation. There was a thought that it was going to be a safe smoking alternative. That has since been debunked. And when we know enough now with what we've seen with hospitalizations from the sensitivity pneumonitis, all these things, that there is immediate impact that we did not see with cigarettes. And if there's an immediate impact, we can't even imagine what the long-term implications are going to be. And so you may see through Google, you may see through certain ad outlets online that yes, there are studies that looked at comparing traditional nicotine cessation products to vaping and yes, they studied these things. So the data is out there, but it is not an alternative um, in any way, shape or form. And I think Juul just got sued today, or they, they are on the verge of bankruptcy. Um, so that's, you could Google that one too. I mean, that should tell us all something. Sorry, go ahead. I'll take that one on. I, I don't, I, I've heard the same rumor, and that's one thing I will, um, and I'll bring it, I'll address it with the, the police department. Uh, we had, uh, years ago, back when cigarettes were more prevalent, there was a retail, a local retailer, retailer that's no longer in business. There's two of them. One might be an abandoned gas station that we all drive past. And, um, but there was a, um, the, the police did an active um, enforcement on that and it, it really helped and that was with cigarettes. I'm not disparaging the vape shop on the square. I just, that has been a, and I don't know if that's the one, but okay. So 
th that's um, that's something we'll follow up. I'll I'll talk to the police about. They might be ahead of it on it. I've talked to kids about that, like where they get it, and the interesting question, the interesting responses I get are, it, it, you know, through online, and I don't know how they do it. I know the code for it when they text is the shopping cart. That's the code for cartridge. Mm -hmm. Like if you text, if your friend texts you an emoji of um, a shopping cart with a leaf that, you know, do you have marijuana cartridges? Mm -hmm. um, that shopping cart is a big one for uh, texting. And again, the kids told, tell me that. As far as going on the um, Amazon, I'm not sure, but that the kids have told me that they've ordered it online. They haven't, or it's through friends. I haven't heard the local retailer because I ask, you know, um, but I'll, I'll follow up with the, the police department on that. Well, there, so there are things called ghost apps, which look like regular apps. They look like calculators, look like things like that, that can be used to hide images, anything like that. But those change all the time, and there's new ones created every single day, um, probably. Um, so, you know, always trying to stay ahead of it. But, you know, uh, in addition to that, I mean, it's, it's the social media apps. It's, it's the ones that... All the, I mean, all, I don't want to say all the kids are using, uh, but you know, I, I think the ones that are that are popular that they use, and you'd said WhatsApp and Snapchat, we've talked about, and TikTok and all of those. But um, you know, they all have forms of messaging in them themselves, uh, not just having to host a video or put a video up, but they all have comment sections and all of that, and those are always ever changing. So, you know, I, as far as which ones to look out for, I don't want to sit up here and say all of them. But at the same point in time, too, knowing, I guess, again, and it's going back to having those, what I like to say in uh, the, the DHS small talks is the small casual conversations as to online safety, what it looks like, um, really just trying to talk to them about some of those healthy habits that they can have with their phone and with online, online use. Before we before we break up, we're gonna because that, that was the plan, right? S keep it at, in an hour and go down the hall. Um, w from the parents, especially, would there be any interest in going forward, like um, doing something like this again? Uh, you know, like having some head nods. Um, and if there's topics, to, I mean, we could. There's a whole bunch of, and I, I don't want to be like it's all doom and gloom. The kids are like that. I see are gr the kids that I have in court are great kids. Like it's not all dismal right but it's just it's this whole thing we didn't ever have to deal with i mean your thing was text messaging when i think it was like are you going to go to there was the note that was folded up and you're, you know live in a mansion a house or whatever that game was right but now they're just stressed out i didn't get 50 likes on my instagram post so i yep. you know i'm stressed out about that like what the hell is that like i i'm devastated because she said no to prom you know and that was on a note where this is instant gratification of I got 50 likes on my Instagram post, and now and my friend got 80, so she's he's more popular than I am now. I'm devastated, so I'm going to go hit a jewel, right? So, but if there's other things we could talk about, we haven't. There's you know other things that we if we could do, I would like to do it again because again my thing is to impact one kid a year. This is part of that. If it's one kid that's in this room, awesome. I did my I somewhere did my job. 
That's all I'm after. So I'm down to do it. And we talked, another thing we talked about too is if we have to do it like in the morning, if it's like coffee or whatever, coffee with the judge or whatever, I don't know, whatever it is, like to try to reach more people, I'm open to it. You know, like, um, and, and if you're interested, because the only way we're going to learn is talking to each other and talking to, talking to the kids. But So anyway, I, if you're interested, I saw some head nods. I think we'll do it again. I would like, I'll push the school to try to do it again. I appreciate the school doing this. Mm -hmm. And everybody coming and taking their time. I'm not trying to wrap this up, but I think we wanted to do keep it to an hour and go down and look at that other thing. You had one? Yeah, well, just about, um, like, uh, this, was, this was a nice uh, meeting here. Is it would be appropriate to have, or have one of them geared towards having kids come along? Mm -hmm. I think that'd be cool, because then they can, they see stuff that they're having questions about, and then we can all work together as a community to help address that. We had talked about that a little bit with public health, not on our original board, uh, but they, I would love it because we would learn more. Yeah. yeah we'll you know, we're going to learn. You ask these questions as a kid, they'll tell you. They yeah, the, know the app, you want. yeah. The the apps that I rattled off, it was literally like three weeks ago we did a presentation. I asked the kids like, all right, I know my slides are out of date. What <laughs> apps are you kids using? And they told me. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Hundred percent. That's our only hope. Man. Like, the reason we don't show them the in plain sight is because there's a lot of things in there that just are. If they don't know it, they don't know it. Um, it that's just kind of the general rule that was like hidden in plain sight isn't just a Walworth County thing. It's used. I don't want to say it's also nationwide. It's it's not 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 something that's proprietary us, but everything else has been 21 plus. We asked for parents only. Um, there are a lot of things that we've spent a lot of time researching to find what is being used, what's out there. So just more for geared toward parents. Um, but vaping presentations and stuff like that, that, public health has done, and I know that other entities have done them as well. So, Yeah, we've had some great um, presentations with kids as young as in sixth grade, just really engaging, and absolutely, they give us some of the best information. Mm -hmm. They don't shy away from, from mm -hmm. sharing, which is great. We oh, one behind, behind you. you, quick. Behind you. <laughs> Go ahead. And, and I will say. Yep, so, so two things. Number one, uh, in the medical community, I'm gonna make a push for pagers. They're coming back. Um, <laughs> number two, when we counsel about things, it's usually about one hour of screen time to two hours at most. That doesn't include Chromebook use for school, things like that. So, I mean, if you target for an hour, that's what we're recommending. And to your point, that's still too much. We need to have engagement. We need to have personal conversation, eye-to-eye -eye contact. That helps with a lot more development than this. And. Mm -hmm. right. Exactly, Awful. and Awful. and this yeah. <laughs> this goes back to the point of how do we do that self hygiene? How do we start before there's a problem? And and unfortunately, it starts with somebody's got to do it, and people have to follow. And how that looks like, we don't know, but somebody's got to make a change, and it's got to catch on. My so it sounds like we're all kind of struggling because I'm the single you know, my 11 year old son mom's her birthday was she studying for gear sports and then it's working out too. But it's like the balance of it all, right? Because we want them to enjoy all these other activities, but to modern day society is allowing cell phones and that's how they're connecting with their friends and stuff. Well, but not just watching the more that we saw. Right. I mean, you know, we have a cell phone anymore. But um, not a big deal. Yeah. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Yeah, we can put that on. I think we'll we'll make note of that and and keep that cell phone discussion going because it's we're all struggling with it. And I think we're open as a panel of school, like this is a community effort. So if you have a presenter or mm -hmm. somebody like that's an expert in that area, we welcome that. Like bring that information as well. Mm -hmm. And to just give a shout out to the schools, like this year we What did you do? I don't know what you did. Exactly what the cell phone policy is at the high school? Sure, I would love to. I know you would. <laughs> uh, no, it's, I mean, at the high school, right, a little more maturity, a little more responsibility, so they, they have them on them. Okay. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Cool, thank you. Uh, they have them on them, right? The, the policy is your phone's not out in class. So they have them in passing rooms, they have them at lunch. Some teachers allow them to use them as a resource if they were doing something, right? Mm -hmm. But we're really trying to go to that screen is not Question for, for you guys, as a school, um, how has the response been for when, you know, you said teachers allow some students to use it as a resource, right? So I'm assuming a calculator, things like maybe shop class, things like, like it's right there, yep. So has there been a good response from the students on incentivizing proper use, a proper relationship with the tool versus an improper relationship? Have you guys seen any changes with that? Like do they abuse the privilege is essentially what I'm asking. Could, could we have a follow-up for that for the high school and the middle school at the next the next time we meet you know just yeah, like a follow-up to that question yeah, I can look into that. you know from both it'd be interesting from both the middle school and the yeah. high school and, and the only reason I ask is we're not going to get rid of these like right there they are a tool they are useful you know I have to have it when I'm on call there people have to have it at work but it's incentivizing a healthy relationship similar to what you would do with food or other things right it's a healthy relationship with what's in your environment I need that though. I mean, that is <laughs> serious. I, seriously. <laughs> That's why it's community effort. Yeah. Because even all, I mean, I can do the same thing and draw and develop from it. We all can. And when we're the examples, it helps trickle down to our children because yes. they make better examples as well. Yes. Right. You know, sometimes they get, you know, hair to butter or something. <laughs> It's great to hear.
we got to talk more. I mean, I want to learn more about this because mm-hmm. this is all new to me, yeah. you know, and, and that's, that's something if I can incorporate some of this in court with it, I, that would be, that would be helpful to me to, to help it. I, go ahead. Can you give us the site again? Because some common sense media. Common sense media. Got it. Take them in the hall. Sure. Good. Good. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it.